Have you ever tried to tell someone how to feel? How did that go for you? <laughs> I learned a valuable lesson years ago about feelings. Don't have any. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Uh, in a favorite movie of ours, um, uh, trust gets broken uh, between a man and a woman when there's been a betrayal. Uh, and she is very, very angry. And he makes the mistake of telling her to not feel angry. But she says, there is nothing you can do for me. I just have to feel this way until I don't feel this way anymore. And you just have to know that you made me feel this way. I learned a number of years ago that feelings are not the most important thing. What we believe to be true is most important because our feelings are based on that. In our story today, Jesus appears to two people on Resurrection Day who have not heard the good news yet. They are believing something false and they are hopeless. And in this story, Jesus shows us how we can pump resurrection life into hopeless hearts. Here's the passage from Luke 24 on the road to Emmaus. Now that very day, two of them were on their way to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking to each other about all the things that had happened. While they were talking and debating these things, Jesus himself approached and began to accompany them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Then he said to them, what are these matters you are discussing so intently as you walk along? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened there in these days? He said to them, What things? The things concerning Jesus the Nazarene, they replied, a man who, with his powerful deeds and words, proved to be a prophet before God and all the people, and, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Not only this, but it's now the third day since these things happened. Furthermore, some women of our group amazed us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back and said they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see him. So he, Jesus, said to them, you foolish people, how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Wasn't it necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things written about himself in all the scriptures. So as they approached the village where they were going, he acted as though he wanted to go farther, but they urged him, stay with us because it is getting toward evening and the day is almost done. So he went in to stay with them. When he had taken his place at the table with them, he took the bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. At this point, their eyes were opened and they recognized him. Then he vanished out of their sight. They said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us while he was speaking with us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us? So they got up at that very hour and returned to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and those with them gathered together and saying, The Lord has really risen and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how they recognized him when he broke the bread. Our big idea for this session is that we can pump resurrection life into hopeless hearts. And that's what we see Jesus doing here. He's our great example, of course, in this passage. He does it in three main ways, and we're going to spend a few minutes on each of these ways. First of all, simply engage. Second, explain. Third, encounter. 
I want to give uh, some credit to uh, my brother, Micah Dolby, who is from our home church in Montana. I heard him preach a message from this story, from this passage on uh, Easter Sunday. And uh, I've taken uh, a couple things from this outline, from uh, his message that day, that really spoke to me about this story. But let's talk about the setting of this story, and we see it in the first several verses. Now that very day, that is the, the resurrection day, resurrection morning, and there's a number of things that are happening that these two are totally unaware of, right? That very day, two of them were on their way to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. So it appears that they're on their way home because the Passover is finished. They were talking to each other about all the things that had happened, while they were talking and debating these things, Jesus himself approached and began to accompany them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Have you ever heard the phrase, being in the wrong place at the wrong time? It's still Resurrection Day, and it's something amazing has happened and is still happening, but these two Unknown disciples are missing out. They're, they're missing out on all these things. For them, the Passover is over. <laughs> they're going home. They had hoped that this would be the most amazing, the most life-changing Passover ever. But their hope is gone. But is it true? It is not true. And Jesus is not willing for them to continue in their deception and confusion as they are going over every conversation and action of the last hours and days, even debating what it all might have meant. Jesus himself joins them and he is about to jumpstart their hope. We can pump resurrection life into hopeless hearts as well as we follow the example of Jesus. First of all, he engaged them with questions. Jesus was great at this sort of thing, engaging with questions. His first question was, what are these matters you are discussing so intently as you walk along? Well, when he asks this question, one of the things that he does is he draws out their emotions right away. They, they actually stop walking and they're looking very sad, right? One of them, named Cleopas, answers him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened here in these days? Well, instead of Jesus answering the question and saying, uh, Yeah, as a matter of fact, or, or instead of saying, uh, Actually, I'm Jesus, and I'm surprised you haven't recognized me. No, instead, he follows up with another question. And simply he says, What things? And so he has them dig a little deeper and he's searching for what they believe and what they know about him, about the whole situation. Uh, they say, the, the things concerning Jesus the Nazarene, they replied. A man who with his powerful deeds and words proved to be a prophet before God and all the people. Now, so they don't believe that Jesus is the son of God. They, at this point, they believe that he is a prophet in God's sight. They had hoped he was going to be their Messiah, but obviously he wasn't. He's not. Verse 20, And how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. So they placed the responsibility for Jesus' death squarely on the Jewish leaders. Verse 21, We had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Not only this, but it is now the third day since these things happened. So you might Recall that for the Jewish people, after three days pass, when someone has died, three days pass, uh, they had a belief that uh, after three days, that the spirit and the body have separated forever. But uh, during those three days, that the spirit of the person stays nearby, and somehow there's hope in that, in that time frame. But here they say, and now... Obviously, there's no hope because three days have come and gone, and obviously nothing's going to change. He could never come back to life now. Furthermore, some women of our group amazed us 
or did they amuse them? <laughs> we, re we recall what, what the testimony of the women uh, was viewed as. It wasn't viewed highly. Some women of our group amazed us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back and said they had seen a vision of angels. Is that true? No, the women had actually seen the angels and spoken to them. Here, a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of the men who were with us, is what they mean, went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Oh, it's so important to, to ask questions, right? To engage with questions when we're having a conversation and not be too quick to jump in with answers to things that people may not be wanting to know. <laughs> Jesus is a master teacher, and, and part of his method was to ask great questions. In Mark 8, there are examples of him answering a question with a question, uh, asking questions to gather information, which is what he's doing here. Um, he's communicating passion with a question. He makes a statement with a question. He, he corrects someone with a question. And he gives, he, he's seeking feedback with another question. And with another question, he applies a teaching and he encourages soul searching. All from Mark 8, when Jesus is asking questions to people. Here, Jesus asks two simple questions to discern what these two believe about his identity, his death, and his resurrection. He finds out who they think is responsible for his death, and he discovers that they are hopeless because of their unbelief. This is the first step that Jesus makes with them. He engages them with questions. He draws out their emotions. We, too, can do this exact same thing in the process of, of pumping resurrection life into hopeless hearts. The second thing he does, then, is he explains everything. Well, he explains himself, right? Verses 25 to 27. Uh, these, these people have had, and, and they know the writings of Moses and the prophets, here, Jesus admonishes them to, to belief in what they know to be true, what they have read, what they've, what they've uh, heard. He says to them, you foolish people, how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. <laughs> Think of how many more resources we have than they had. And even today, we are oftentimes slow of heart to believe, right? This phrase, slow of heart to believe. It's literally, oh, unminding and tardy ones to the heart of belief. Why are we so resistant to belief? Why are we so quick to depend on our own senses and our own intellect? But Jesus says, wasn't it necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things written about himself in all the scriptures. Jesus is saying all these things had to happen. And he begins to explain himself. And in the process, he creates a burning inside of these two. And we find out a bit more about that later. A hunger in them. I wonder if these were some of the passages that Jesus referred to. A passage like from Psalm 2, verses 6 to 8. I myself have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. The king says, I will announce the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. This very day I have become your father. Ask me, and I will give you the nations as your inheritance, the ends of the earth as your personal property. What was it like for Jesus that day to, uh, to open these passages and to say, this is talking about the Messiah. David's talking about the Messiah. He's talking about the Redeemer. And he's talking about himself, talking about himself. Psalm 110, 1. Here is the Lord's proclamation to my Lord. Sit down at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. 
Friends, this is the Messiah. This is the Redeemer that David's talking about. Psalm 118, 22 to 24. The stone that the builders discarded has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's work. We consider it amazing. This is the day the Lord has brought about. We will be happy and rejoice in it. My friends, David is talking about this day and this cornerstone. Jesus is opening up and and describing himself through uh, the Psalms, through Moses, through the prophets. Here's from Isaiah 53, verses 5 to 10. He was wounded because of our rebellious deeds, crushed because of our sins. He endured punishment that made us well. Because of his wounds, we have been healed. All of us had wandered off like sheep. Each of us had strayed off on his own path, but the Lord caused the sin of all of us to attack him. He was treated harshly and afflicted, but he did not even open his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughtering block, like a sheep silent before her shearers, he did not even open his mouth. He was led away after an unjust trial, but who even cared? Indeed, he was cut off from the land of the living. Because of the rebellion of his own people, he was wounded. They intended to bury him with criminals, but he ended up in a rich man's tomb because he had committed no violent deeds, nor had he spoken deceitfully. Though the Lord desired to crush him and make him ill, once restitution is made, he will see descendants and enjoy long life, and the Lord's purpose will be accomplished through him. Can you imagine what it was like that day? What it would be like for you to to have Jesus walking beside you. You don't know it's Jesus. And he's explaining this passage to you. That it's all about him. Or it's all about the Messiah, the Redeemer. And he's making it all clear. I'm just imagining light bulbs. Bing, 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 bing. Light bulbs going on all over the place. One more from Daniel 7, verses 13 to 14. I was watching in the night visions, and with the clouds of the sky, one like a son of man was approaching. He went up to the Ancient of Days and was escorted before him. To him was given ruling authority, honor, and sovereignty. All peoples, nations, and language groups were serving him. His authority is eternal and will not pass away. His kingdom will not be destroyed. Jesus not only engages them with questions, but he explains all of the scriptures of the Old Testament that are about himself. They're about the Messiah, the anointed one, and their hearts are burning within them. Yes, life is being pumped into their hopeless hearts and they don't even realize it in this moment. The third thing that happens here, the third big thing that happens is the encounter at the table. Verse 28 says, So they approached the village where they were going. He acted as though he wanted to go farther, but they urged him, Oh, stay with us, because it's getting toward evening and the day is almost done. So he went in to stay with them. So Jesus enters their home, kind of their home territory. He's on their turf we would say. And why is that? It's because they wanted more, right? They were hungry for more. And that's a beautiful and wonderful thing. Let's talk for a moment about the significance of coming to the table together. Verse 30, when he had taken his place at the table with them, he took the bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Here's a question. Why is Jesus acting as the host at the table in their house? I wonder if it's simply because they have recognized, and of course he knows it, they have recognized that he is their teacher in these moments that they've been together and they look to him to lead. And and Jesus takes the bread, blesses it, breaks it, and gives it to them. Let's talk about the, this word, this phrase, at the table or at table. The most sacred place inside the home of a Jewish person was designated 
at the table. The term for this sacred space is mikdash ma'at. This is translated little sanctuary or mini temple. The saying from the Western world, a man's home is his castle, could be said like this in the Near Eastern world, a man's home is his little sanctuary or his mini temple. And inside the mini temple that is at the table of my home, the mikdash ma'at, a sacred space. This is a sacred space for heart-to-heart connection with friends and with God. Brennan Manning in the Ragamuffin Gospel says this, In the Near East, to share a meal with someone is a guarantee of peace, trust, a brotherhood, and forgiveness. The shared table symbolizes a shared life. And Orthodox Jews saying, I would like to have dinner with you, is a metaphor that implies, I would like to enter into friendship with you. Within this cultural context, the most appropriate place in the house to worship Jesus with total devotion and abandon was at the table. And their eyes are opened. Another story of eyes being opened. Verse 31, at this point, their eyes were opened and they recognized him. Then he vanished out of their sight. What a dramatic reveal this is. They said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us while he was speaking with us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us? Oh, my friends, Jesus pumps resurrection life into their hopeless hearts. And at this moment, they are as filled with hope as they can possibly be. And you and me, (laughs) we can do the same thing. What did they do? So at that moment, that very hour, they got up and they returned to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and those with them gathered together and saying, The Lord has really risen. These are, the, these are what the disciples are saying. The Lord has risen and has, has, he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how they recognized him when he broke the bread. First, engage with questions. We need to get better at asking good questions, better at waiting for an answer, better at asking the second question. We've been learning this with our own uh, adult kids. Um, In some ways, we've discovered in recent years that um, there's a lot of things about our adult, our three adult kids that we don't know and things that they haven't necessarily shared with us because we've been a part We've been living uh, in uh, northern Iraq and there in the U.S. And there's so much about just daily life that we miss out on. And sometimes if we if we're with them, uh, we're together, we're out having some coffee, we're having a meal together. And if we ask, hey, how are you doing or how's your uh, Bible reading? How's your devotional life? Uh, And they'll say, oh, it's going fine. And and we we've made the mistake of stopping there and not asking another question or another question and trying to go a little bit deeper than basically just talking about the weather, you know? We need to get better at asking questions. You know, I think we're better at planning out what we want to say than what we want to ask or what we actually want to hear from someone's mouth. Before your next anticipated conversation, Think about what questions you want to ask. What questions need to be asked to dig deeper and to engage with your friend, with this person that you care about? Yes, ask good questions and keep asking. Jesus was the master at getting below the surface and and discovering what, what was really going on. Secondly, there, there is a time for explaining, and that can be an amazing time. The time, I would say the time is perfect when the person or the people have answered 
all of your questions and you have discerned where they really are at, what it is that they're truly believing and how they're feeling in the middle of their own situation, then when that time is right, the Holy Spirit will, will give you the exact words needed. What are, we, what are we headed toward? We're headed toward that encounter at the table. Where do significant conversations take place in your culture or for your family? Some families in North America have recognized that the kitchen is such an important family area that they've designed or, or they've changed their home to facilitate or to reflect that. Maybe in your culture, it's a different part of the house, or maybe it's outside, like, uh, like on a picnic or at a special cafe. I remember years ago, um, learning uh, how to make what we call Arabic tea. Uh, the, word, the word for it in Senegal is ataya, uh, where you take Chinese green tea and you put it in a pot and you maybe add some fresh mint and you put it over the charcoal. And it's just this long process. And, and in the end, it's not really about the tea, but it's several hours of just digging deep with each other and having a conversation that gets into the heart of what I really am feeling and what I'm really thinking about. Those are times of encounter, uh, not at a table, but around a teapot, around the charcoal fire, in the dirt. God can use any time and any place, but it could be that he will use the most natural place to encounter you and those you care about. Look for him at the table. Look for him around the teapot at that place where all the distractions are, are put aside and we really see each other, we really hear each other. Look for him there. Take him there. That is where we can bring resurrection life into hopeless hearts for the glory of God.